This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. My name is Rod Rutherford. I'm your teacher in a study of the New Testament church. We are studying from the Word of God to find the one true church. The New Testament is the pattern for God's church. And so far in our study, we have observed several things about the church. We have noted the close relationship between Christ and His church. We have also looked at various descriptions of the church in the Bible. We have studied the pattern of the church, and we are in the process now of studying the worship of the church. We have pointed out that there are two essentials of true worship, in spirit, that is, the right attitude, and in truth, the right acts. Today, we are studying lesson number nine, the worship of the church, part five. The worship of the church, part five. There are five acts of worship in the New Testament which God has ordained that should be carried out by His church on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. These five acts of worship are the Lord's Supper, praying, singing, giving, and preaching. Today, we are going to be studying about giving as an act of worship. Any organization in the world must have money to carry on its work. The same is true with the church. We live in a society where money is used in order to purchase things that are needed and in order to do various things. The church has certain needs. It has a need for a meeting place. It has a need for literature to use in preaching the gospel. It has a need for Bibles and for song books. And of course, there's a need for the supporting of gospel preachers. And so, in order to have the needs of the church met, God has given a plan. God has given the perfect plan for church finance in the New Testament, and that's by our giving, our free will offerings on the first day of the week. Now, here's something I want to emphasize I believe is very important. Giving is an act of worship. Giving is an act of worship. There are those who might question that, and they do not include even giving as a part of the worship service on the Lord's Day. Uh, they raise their money by various other means, but the Bible teaches that giving is an act of worship. Under the Old Testament law, giving was required of all the people of Israel. One had to give the best of his herds and the best of his flocks for sacrifice to God. One gave 10% of all his income to God. It was considered an act of worship. So it is also in the New Testament, giving as God has prospered us is an act of worship. We pay homage to God by that which we give. We're going to study giving in this lesson as an act of worship, but we're also going to emphasize that this act of worship is the only means, the only means God has given His church to raise money for its work. Now, the first point we want to observe is this. Denominations, that is, man-made churches, use various means to raise money. Denominations or man-made churches use various means to raise money. I'm sure you're familiar with many of these practices, uh, as I am. There are many religious bodies that practice tithing today. Now, tithing is simply giving 10% of one's income. We've already seen that tithing was an Old Testament practice. It was a part of the law that God gave to Israel. In, Malach uh, in Leviticus 27, Leviticus 27 and verse 30, we have this statement, And all the tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man made a hundred dollars, Ten dollars belonged to the Lord. If he had ten sheep, one of them belonged to the Lord. If he, put, if he picked uh, 
ten baskets of apples, one of the ten went to the Lord. That was the law under the law of Moses. We do not live under that law today. We live under the New Testament, the new covenant of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That old law that God gave to Israel, we are told by Paul in Colossians 2, verse 14, was nailed to the cross. That is, it ended when Jesus Christ died on the cross. And we today are under the New Testament, and so it must be to the New Testament that we go in order to learn what God's law of giving is. Giving is commanded in the New Testament, but tithing is not. Let me repeat that. Giving is commanded, tithing is not. Many man-made churches or human denominations use gimmicks to get people to give. Now, by gimmick, I mean uh, some method or some trick or they give you something uh, in order to get you to give in return. Bingo is commonly practiced by our friends in the Roman Catholic Church. This is simply a game. You, play money to, you pay money to play, and then you're given a small prize if you win, but the church makes a lot of money out of this. Some have raffles. They sell tickets, and it's, raffles are really a form of gambling. Others have what they call walkathons, where members agree to walk and others agree to sponsor them by paying so much uh, per meter or mile that's walked, per kilometer or mile. Some have bake sales where ladies bake uh, cakes and bread and so forth and sell it, and the money goes to the church. Others have auctions of things that people have given, and then they sell that. These are all methods to get people to give their money to the church, but the people not, are not really giving. They're getting something in return. When people have to be entertained, when people have to be entertained, or when they have to be given something in return for giving to the church, then something is seriously wrong with their faith. Something is seriously wrong with their love for the Lord. They don't really love the Lord as they ought. That's why God has commanded that we give free will offerings, offerings out of our own free will. He wants us to give cheerfully, not because we have to, but because we love Him and want to help His kingdom. There are some denominations that make a lot of money out of business investments. The Roman Catholic Church, for example, is a major investor in the trade of the world. They have billions upon billions, thousands of millions of dollars invested in real estate, invested in various companies and corporations around the world, and they earn great money from that. And the Roman Catholic Church overall is very rich. The Mormon Church, also called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is one of the rich, richest religious bodies in the world because they own a great deal of business and they use the income to support various works of the church. They own hotels, uh, chains of hotels and restaurants and things of this nature. But we're concerned with God's pattern for giving. God's pattern for giving is given in the New Testament. God's pattern for giving is given in the New Testament. And we want to look at that pattern right now. Uh, these are verses that I learned long ago, and I can quote them, but I want to read them. And I hope that you will follow along in your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul, by inspiration, is writing to the church of God, which is at Corinth. He says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Now, Paul is an inspired apostle of God. There are some who say, Paul was simply making up a collection. It was just a, a temporary thing for a temporary need, and he had no intention of giving a law of giving uh, for all time, but I disagree with that. Paul was an inspired apostle of God, and whatever he wrote was written by inspiration. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 37, Paul had earlier stated, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, that is, spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. What was Paul writing? He was writing the commandments of the Lord. And if we go back to the beginning of the Corinthian epistle, in Paul's opening words to the Corinthians, he addresses it to the church of God, which is at Corinth. And then in verse 2, he says, Also to all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians was written to the church at Corinth. But friends, it was also written to us today, to every church of God or church of Christ in all the world. And the same instruction that Paul gave to Corinth, he had given to the churches of Galatia. Notice again 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, or particularly verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. And so it was given to other churches as well, including all those who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. He's talking about you and he's talking about me. Now Paul was involved in raising money for the needy churches in Jerusalem. And there's no doubt about that. And the needy among the saints in Jerusalem and Judea. But I believe the Holy Spirit used this particular uh, event to give God's law of giving to the church for all time. The Holy Spirit, you know, was revealing through the apostles all the truth. And the New Testament was in the process of being compiled. Jesus had said in John 14 and verse 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. And so the Holy Spirit was gradually unfolding God's revelation to the apostles. We don't read about the church at Jerusalem having elders, and yet it was God's plan for them to have elders. We don't read about elders till we get to Acts chapter 11 and verse 30 and find that there were elders in place. Uh, so gradually God unfolded His plan through the Holy Spirit and His inspired men. The Apostle Paul taught the same doctrine everywhere. He didn't teach one thing in Corinth and another thing among the churches of Galatia and another thing at Rome, but he taught the same gospel, the same doctrine every place. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 17, he reminded them that he was going to send Timothy to them, and he said, Timothy will remind you of my ways in Christ, now note, as I teach everywhere in every church. Paul taught the same doctrine everywhere. He had taught giving to the churches of Galatia. He taught it to the church at Corinth, an epistle that was directed to all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can learn from that that Paul's law of giving was meant for all Christians everywhere and for all time. It is a part of the faith once for all delivered unto the saints. But the method of carrying out, or the means of carrying out God's method of giving is plainly given in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2. He says, On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside. The King James Version, I believe, says, Put something in store, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Now I want us to look at this law of giving very carefully. We want to look at each part of it and analyze it and learn what God would have us to do today. And we can learn from this when we're to give, who is to give, what we're to give, how much we're to give, and why we're to give. First of all, when are we to give? On the first day of the week. The day is plainly stated. When are we to give? On the first day of the week. Now we already learned in our earlier studies on worship that the day set aside in the New Testament as a special day of worship is Sunday, the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. This was the day, you will remember, when our Lord arose from the grave. This was also the day, as you may recall, when the Church of Christ began. Pentecost Day always occurred on the first day of the week. 
the day following the seventh Sabbath, going from the time of the Passover. And so the first day of the week was an important day. From Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, we learn that it was a day the disciples came together to worship, to break bread, and to have preaching. And so this is the day when Paul commanded the collection should be taken. It should be taken as a part of that worship because it is an act of worship and it was the very time when all the Christians were assembled. In the original Greek, according to Thayer's Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament, uh, the phrase, the first day of the week, we have the Greek word kata there, and that signifies the first day of every week, the first day of every week. So this was not just a one-time contribution, but rather this was a contribution that was to be made uh, every first day of every week. And so a congregation today, when it meets together to worship God, needs to take a contribution. It needs to be given, ev or given every first day of every week. But then the second point we can learn about God's law of giving in the New Testament is who is to give. Who is to give? And he says, let each one of you. Who? Each one of you. Every one of us has an obligation to give as we are prospered, and we're going to look at that in just a moment, and we'll discuss that further. But giving, like singing or taking the Lord's Supper, is an individual act. It's done as a part of corporate worship. That is, it's done as a part of the assembly when we all come together to worship, and yet it's an individual act. You cannot take the Lord's Supper in my place, nor can I take it in your place. You cannot sing praises to God for me, nor can I sing for you. Each one of us must sing and make melody in, in our hearts. The same is true with giving. Now somebody else might drop the money in the contribution plate when it's passed, and I've given it to them to do, but each one must have a part in the giving. My wife and I have a common bank account, as we should, I believe. Uh, since we are husband and wife, we're one, we have a common bank account, and we just write one check on the Lord's Day to put in the contribution plate, and usually I drop it in the plate, but she is giving as much as I because it's from our common bank account. We're both giving, so you may not have to drop the check or the, or the money into the collection plate, but it must be your contribution. Each of us has a responsibility to give. Let each one of you, I cannot give for another, nor another for me. And then another part of God's law of giving is what we must do. What? And that is to lay by in store. What? Lay by in store. Now, to lay by in store is translated in the Old King James Version. I mean, to lay by in store is the Old King James Version. The New King James has lay something aside. Lay something aside. This simply means that every Christian must separate a portion of his income to be given to the church. If you're working at a job and you know you're going to receive a certain number of uh, dollars or rupees or whatever your uh, currency is at the end of the week or at the end of the month, then you need to budget that. You know how much you're going to have to spend for food and perhaps rent, uh, children's school expenses, whatever your expenses are. But a portion of that should be designated for the church. And you may uh, want to give it each Lord's Day a portion of the portion that you set aside, however you do it. But each of us must determine that we're going to give a portion of our income to the church. The Greek word in the original language of the New Testament for lay by in store or lay something aside actually means to put into the treasury. According to Brother J.W. McGarvey in his commentary on the New Testament epistles, to put into the treasury. That means that the church is going to have a treasury. There must be some place the money is kept. I would recommend that every congregation open some sort of a bank account or savings account instead of letting the money stay in some brother's home where thieves might break in and get into it or somebody might be tempted to take it. That's just a wise and safe thing to do. The next point we want to notice is how much. 
How much are we to give? And the Bible says, as he may prosper, or as God has prospered him. How much are we to give? As we're prospered. Now, what does that mean? Well, that's a very fair way, friends. If you're not prospered, that is, if you don't have any income, obviously you're unable to give, and God does not expect you to do that which it is not possible for you to do. But if you have some income, then you are expected by God to give a portion of that to Him. Now, under the old covenant, the old law of Moses given to Israel, they gave a tithe, that is 10%. But God's law in the New Testament is really uh, fairer than that under the Old Testament because it means that the one who has more will give more and the one who has less will give less. Let's suppose, for example, that here are two men and these two men work at the same job. They have the same income. They both make exactly the same amount of money each week. Now, one man has only his wife and himself to support. The other man has a wife and children and several other relatives, and he's supporting about 12 people. Now, two men make the same income. One man has expenses only for two people, himself and his wife. The other man has expenses for about 12 relatives that he's taking care of, including himself. Uh, can they both give the same to the Lord? No, and the Lord doesn't expect them to. The man who uh, uh, has less expenses ought to be able to give more to the Lord than the man who has more expenses. The rich give more, the poor give less, but all must give as they have been prospered by God. And then a final point on God's law of giving, and that is why. Why do we need to give? And Paul answers that, that there be no collections when I come. Why? That there be no collections when I come. Now, Paul was making money up, a contribution to help the needy back in Jerusalem and Judea, and he wanted the people to have the money ready. It would be there, and it would be uh, available to take care of the need, and they wouldn't have to have some special collection. If the church follows God's plan of finance given here in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, then the church will have the money on hand in its special treasury to take care of needs when those needs arrive. Having a weekly offering, having a church budget, well, a church can take care of all the needs that may come up. And so it's a very wise practice. You know, friends, we cannot improve upon God's plan. There's no way that we can improve upon God's plan. God's plan is best. God's plan works. It is up to us to work the plan. But now let's look at some further principles concerning giving, some principles that are given in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. The principles which guide giving are given in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. The principles which guide giving are given in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. Now, Paul is still talking about this contribution that he's raising to help the poor, but in the midst of giving that instruction, he gives us some very interesting and helpful guidelines concerning our giving today. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, notice verse 5. Paul is speaking about the churches of Macedonia. He's held them up as an example of generous giving. Even though they were very, very poor, he said, they gave according to their ability and even beyond their ability in order to help their brethren who were suffering. Now, verse, eight, verse 5 of chapter 8, Paul says, And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Friends, if we first give ourselves to the Lord, it'll be easy for us to give of our financial resources. It will be very easy indeed. There won't be any difficulty at all. We will gladly give whatever we can because we have given ourselves to the Lord. The Bible teaches that we need to do this. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, the Apostle Paul is emphasizing that 
We belong to the Lord. The Spirit of God dwells in us and so on. And he says, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. I'm a slave. I'm a slave, but I'm a slave that has the greatest freedom that anybody could have. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ, and yet Christ has set me free from the terrible slavery of bondage or bondage to sin and to Satan. I have been bought with a price, and the price paid for me was the highest price of all, far higher than silver, gold, or any form of wealth on this earth. The purchase price was the blood of Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian, you don't belong to yourself. You belong to Jesus Christ. And so you have given yourself to the Lord in your obedience to the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1, Paul encouraged, excuse me, Paul encouraged the Christians at Corinth, at Rome rather, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Our bodies are presented as a living sacrifice. Under the old law, the people of Israel brought animal sacrifices to God. They brought burnt offerings. It might be a sheep, a goat, a cow, and these were burned on the altar to God. But under the new covenant, we present our bodies not as dead sacrifices that are burned, but as living sacrifices to the Lord. And so these Christians to whom Paul is, uh, about whom Paul is speaking had first given themselves to the Lord. And then it was not difficult for them to give of their means. Secondly, we learn in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 that one needs to follow the example of the Savior. In uh, chapter 8 and verse 9, Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might become rich. Now think about that, brethren, if you will. Here is Jesus Christ. He's in heaven. He has millions of angels to serve him. He is in a place of glory and beauty beyond compare. The mind of man cannot even begin to comprehend how wonderful heaven really is. And that's where our Lord was. But he willingly gave that up. He graciously left his home in heaven, was born in a stable in uh, Bethlehem of a poor peasant woman. He lived a life of a poor man working in a carpenter's shop. He became a wandering preacher. He said, the foxes have their holes and the birds have their nests but the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. He owned no property on this earth. And he died the most cruel, painful, shameful death of all, a death by crucifixion. He died on the cross for your sins and mine. Think what he gave up in order to come and live and die for you and me. Now, if we look at what Christ gave up at his supreme sacrifice, then it ought to encourage us to at least follow his example to the, intent, to the extent that we willingly give of that which God has given to us. Another principle of giving that is stated here is the, the principle of sowing and reaping. There is a principle of sowing and reaping that is found throughout the Bible. It is a principle in the natural world, in the physical realm, and we are all familiar with this. If a man sows a certain type of seed, that's the type of plant that will come up. If we plant wheat, wheat will grow. If we plant rice, rice and not something else will grow. And so whatever we sow, we reap. And the more that we plant, the greater the harvest will be. We understand that too. Now these, of course, have spiritual counterparts as well. What we do in our lives as far as the way we live uh, we are going to reap from that. If we spend our lives living in sin, we'll reap a harvest from that, and it will be eternal punishment in hell. If we spend our lives in service to God, we will reap from that too, that which we have sown, and that will be an eternal home in heaven with God. Well, notice this principle is mentioned in regard to giving. First of all, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6. 
Paul says, but this I say, he who throw, sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So if you go out here to sow seed and you just put a few seed down, you're not going to have a very big harvest. But if you scatter a lot of seed, the more the seed, the more that will grow and the greater the harvest will be. And the same is true in our giving. The more that we give, the more God is going to bless us. Notice this statement in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Jesus is speaking and he says, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom. I try to give generously to the Lord as the Lord has prospered me. I've never been a rich man. At least I don't consider myself a rich man by the standards of my country. And yet I've always had plenty to eat. The Lord has always taken care of me. You can tell by looking at me that I'm a fat man. So I have plenty of food. The Lord has provided for me. But the Lord takes care of me and I try to sow bountifully or give generously as God has prospered me. Now notice something else. We must give as we purpose in heart. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. We are to give as we purpose in heart. That means that we are to purpose or plan our giving. If I know how much my income is going to be, then I can determine what portion of that income will be given to the Lord. I can plan in advance. I've seen people at church when the contribution plate is passed reach into their pockets and they pull out some money and they look through it and they count out a little bit and then they put it in the plate. Well, they hadn't planned ahead of time. I write a check from a bank account so that I have a record of my giving, but I, I write that check and I put it in the plate, but I write the check ahead of time when I write the checks to pay my other bills. That's the way I do it. We need to budget our income and that which we give to the Lord should receive priority. Notice our contribution should receive priority in our spending. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In other words, put God in His kingdom first, and then God will take care of us after that. But notice also from 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7, that we are to give uh, not grudgingly or of necessity, but cheerfully. There are some people who give. They may give well, but they don't really want to. Brother David Lipscomb was a gospel preacher who lived in this country, America, in the last century. He told on one occasion how that on Sunday morning when it came time to give, he had a $20 bill that he was going to put in the contribution plate. Now, I think it was a $10 bill he was going to put in the contribution plate, which was a large sum of money in his day. He said, as I began thinking about that, he said, the devil began to tempt me and remind me of all the things that I could use that money for, that I needed other things. And he said, I thought about that, and uh, I knew the devil was tempting me, and so when the contribution plate was passed, instead of putting in 10, I put in 20. I doubled it. He said, you know, the devil never tempted me after that when it came time to give. Well, we need to give cheerfully. We know that it's for the work of the Lord, and so we should be glad to do it. Cheerful giving, not grudgingly or just because we have to, but because we love the Lord and we want to give. And you know, if we give as we prosper, that money is not forever gone from us. But rather, that's really the only money that you save. Oh, we may save money in a savings account in a bank, but you know, that's only for this life. It's going to burn up when this old world burns up. When we die, we're going to leave it behind. But if you want to really uh, save money and gain interest on it, then give it to the work of the Lord, and you will be laying up treasures in the bank of heaven. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break through and steal. 
But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moths nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where's your heart? It's where your treasure is. With some people, that may be in some bank someplace. But it should be that your heart is in heaven. That's your country. That's where you desire to go above all else. And so you're laying up treasures in heaven by giving to the work of the Lord now. We must remember that as Christians, we're stewards of all that God has given us. A steward is one who is simply in charge of property given to him by others. Christians are stewards of all that God has given. Everything that we have is ours because God has made it possible for us to have it. We have the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 that illustrates what a steward is. There was a man who had three servants. He's going to a far country. He calls his servants together and he divides to them his money. One he gives five talents, another two and another one. He goes on his journey. Then he comes back after a long time and he calls his servants to give an account. They're stewards. He entrusted to them his money and now they must account to him how they've used it. The man who had five talents had invested it and made an additional five, as had the man who had two. He had invested it and gained two more. The man who had one talent was a coward. He was afraid that he would lose what he had. He wouldn't take a chance. So he simply dug a hole in the ground and buried the talent and then gave it back to the Lord. And the Lord rewarded the first two stewards for their good stewardship, but the third man he cast out because he was afraid to do anything. Now that illustrates what a steward is, friends. God has given all of us time and opportunity, health, jobs, education, income, whatever we have, it belongs to the Lord. And on Judgment Day, we're going to have to give an account for how we've used these things. We need to be careful of covetousness. It is one of the most common of all sins. Giving is one of the acts of worship. The New Testament pattern of church finance is found in 1 Corinthians 16 too. Remember that. The New Testament pattern of church finance is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2. It's to be done on the first day of the week. We're to give as God has prospered. We must purpose in heart how much we're going to give. We must sow bountifully if we expect to reap bountifully. And we must give cheerfully for God loves a cheerful giver. If we do this, God's church will have all the money it needs to carry out the work that God requires of it to do. We hope that you will join us in our next study of the New Testament church.